Hi everybody, welcome to Bien Cui. Zachary Walker, this is Jeff Seitzma, he's our executive yeah. chef here at the Smith Street location and we just opened our Grand Central Terminal location so you can find his goods and our fare uh, both at GCT and here on Smith Street, on 20 Smith Street. We're here today to talk to you a little bit about our Easter uh, concept bread and I'm going to let Jeff take it away. Sure. We, um we had discussed uh, doing an Easter item uh, about a week or two ago, and uh, one of the things that uh, that struck me as something to do right away is, hey, I want to do a bread instead of doing a sweeter dessert or something like that. And something that I had growing up as a child, my um, my mother is Ukrainian, and uh, every Easter we always had babka. So it's uh, kind of a similar brioche style, so it's... Um, uh, has butter and eggs, and uh, it is just traditionally, uh, and it traditionally has currants or raisins in it. And we always used to have it at Easter dinner. Uh, it's kind of a sweet bread, so it seems kind of a little interesting to have that as part of a dinner. But we used to have always like kielbasa and pierogies and potatoes, and that was just a big part of my growing up. So I always remember this bread. So I wanted to develop our recipe uh, to kind of honor my my heritage. Um, so and what we did is I did a little research about babka. This is actually one of my first times making babka. I mean, there's no like family recipe, so I kind of used what I had. And uh, I did some research and kind of there's some traditional flavors and some non-traditional flavors. So I kind of did a blend of both. So what we did for the bread is we um, poached currants with uh, lemon and vanilla. And just to round out the flavor, there's just more fresh lemon zest and there's also vanilla extract in the dough as well. Um, and then what we do is traditionally what they're done, um, they're baked in coffee cans, like bigger cans, not like, the, you can bake them in different size coffee cans if you want, but traditionally they're baked in like the Folgers bigger cans, and you would uh, bake them in there, and then that's how they would go. Yep, and so they would end up with this look that you can see here, the rib look that you would see in a, a coffee can, and cans typically are reinforced with a ribbed um, structure so that the can itself is less likely to dent. So that's how it comes out looking like that. However, in this circumstance, uh, we have been using a mold that's specifically designed to mimic the look of baking in a coffee can. And I want to tell you a little bit about this mold. This is something that emerged um, about uh, two decades after World War II. And what had happened is during uh, the course of World War I and World War II, uh, the baking molds throughout the various regions of Eastern Europe, uh, Northern Europe, Western Europe, uh, all over Europe, were compiled to, to be used as metal for building tanks and who knows what, whatever they needed to use the metal for. And so a lot of bakeries found themselves absent the baking molds that they used to have. So um, post-World War II, people started baking in coffee cans. Or he's saying it's a tradition to bake in coffee cans. That's a somewhat recent tradition. The bread itself probably had um, some kind of iteration, some kind of look that, uh, that predated using coffee cans. But they started using coffee cans post-World War II um, because it was very easy to find mold and it came out of the oven without warping uh, because of that ribbed effect. It was, the structure was strong enough that it wouldn't change shapes in the oven. So um, that's what people started baking with when people were trying to get back on their feet, creating patisseries. You know, I saw a friend of mine, um, uh, Xavier Fressen, Fressen, F-R-E-S-S-O-N. He was. He showed me a photograph of his grandfather's uh, patisserie that opened about five years after uh, World War II was over in France, and it was actually a lean-to. It was literally a lean-to with like a wood-fired oven, and they were getting the water was, was from a well, which was a salinated well, so all everything already had salt in it. He said he told me even the coffee was salty. So. Uh, it, you can. They were starting with very, very little. They were baking with the coffee cans because it's what they had. And then the next generation of patissiers, they would see uh, the coffee can look, and it reminded them of, of what their fathers were doing. So eventually, um, people started making this mold. Let's go ahead and get a close-up on this mold, what this looks like. They started making this mold that uh, mimics the look of a coffee can. This can actually be shut completely and locked, and then when the brioche, or when the when the bread comes up completely, or the babka comes up completely, you end up with the same look that you would have in a coffee can. So this started uh, somewhere, I believe, in the 60s. They started making this mold, and then when I moved to New York, I had 
I had seen this in France. When I was in Blois working at Doucet d'Ormondine, uh, we had these, and I was so impressed, and he told me the whole story that I just told you uh, in French, so I'm like, uh, you know, changing it up a little bit uh, based on my limited amount of French that I speak. But at any rate, um, this mold was uh, what we worked with in France. He showed me how, how to work with it, and it's actually very difficult. You've got to let it proof very high. It would be a lot easier, in fact, to bake in a coffee can, but this one mimics the coffee can. You can reuse it over and over and over. Uh, when I got to New York, we started. Uh, I started looking around for various pieces of equipment that I could find. I always like antiques, so I found uh, this mold. I found one, and I ended up uh, it was at an auction, and I ended up, you know, bidding against this other. He was a Frenchman. We ended up bidding against each other, and we raised the price up to where I paid like thirty-five, fifty dollars something for the first mold that I bought. And then later, I found more of them. I was able to purchase more than much cheaper cost, but uh, at any rate, it was very important to me that we would have these molds so I could carry on that tradition of uh, what existed uh, post-World War II and how that, that moved over towards actually building formal molds. So when Jeff and I started talking about doing a traditional bread, the concept of dipping into his Ukrainian uh, ethnicity was really huge to me. It really resonated in my heart because this is something that we've always believed in. Uh, as far as bringing, bringing real tradition to what we serve here at Yen Kui. Uh, anytime we try to make a bread that is representative of a region, we will uh, either go back to through family recipes or we'll go back to um, what, what information we can find of what was truly made in that region, what ingredients they really had to work with, what equipment they really had to work with. So this opportunity for uh, an, Easter bread, an Easter bread was kind of a, a beautiful chance to both showcase this um, this mold and as well to showcase some of uh, Jeff Seitzman's history and uh, the talent that he brings to uh, to the tables at Game Week. So we thank you very much for tuning in to, uh, to our little uh, snippet here and would like to make it known that it's now available on YouTube. If you guys want to see this video over and over and over, feel free to <laughs> log on to YouTube. and. Um, Again, thanks for thanks for tuning in. We appreciate your time. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.